Okay. Anyone else need their test? Franklin? Savannah? Alberto? Edward? Uh, there we go. Uh, anyone else? Okay, we are recording. Okay, so here are the results for the test. I don't know if you all remember, but after the first test, I told you that I was, I was pretty pleased with the results. Yes? Yeah? So <clears throat> what you see here is a comparison. The blue is the first exam scores, and the orange is the second exam scores. So you can see here, um, I have them right here. This is the first exam, this is the second exam. So the average on the first exam was an 81.9 with a very small standard deviation of 12 points, which meant everyone was close together. And you can see in the second exam, the average is still an 80 in the 80s, which is really good, and a pretty small standard deviation. Um, five A's in the first exam, five A's on the second one. Um, we had 10 B's on the first, nine, so a little bit of a drop. C's were about the same, these were about the same. And you can see here, this is, this is passing, and so this is a comparison of, of the same student. So I guess someone got 100 on this test. That's better than they did on the first test. So you can kind of compare how students have improved. You know, he's had some students, uh, let's see, this student here was not passing the first test and then did better on the second test. So that's good. So <clears throat> overall, I'm happy. Um, I think I... I said to you after the first exam that if you were in this range, I can't force you to come see me, right? Do you remember me saying that? But no one came and saw me. So if you're in here, again, I'm going to strongly urge you to come sit down with me so we can try and figure out what's going on because at this point, if you've been down here for two tests, um, it's not over, but Something has to change. We need to try something new, all right? So, yeah, all right. And then uh, anything else you want to discuss about the test? Did you, did you all have enough time? I wasn't here. Did, did a lot of you finish on time? Who ran out of time? Just raise your hands. <clears throat> Who ran out of time on the test? Anyone run out of time? No? Yeah, you ran out of time, Tatum? A little, a, a little bit? I mean, okay. okay. I wasn't going to raise my hand, but what I noticed, it wasn't a matter of like running out of time so much as they just didn't really know what to do. So they yeah. I'm just curious how many people were here at the end when they called time. Like, were there a lot of people here still? Okay. All right. Um, okay, so one problem on the test when I was grading it, I was just... I, I like kicked my dog because I was so frustrated. No, I'm kidding. I didn't do that. No, number three. I just I couldn't believe how difficult people made this problem. So number three specifically, a lot of students got it correct, but the way they did it was just way too much work. This one right here, right? So you're asked to take the derivative of that. And a lot of people just went right to the quotient rule. Just, let's just do the quotient rule. Um, what I was hoping you would do was split this into three fractions. Like that. Okay, so each term over the denominator. And then simplify. So this is just x. This one, if you combine these, you get... Uh, 4x to the negative 1 half when you do the exponent rules on that. So you get 4x to the negative 1 half. And this one you get plus 6x to the negative 1. And then at this point, you just do your power rule. You know, take derivative of each one. So derivative of that is 1. Derivative of this, negative 1 half comes out. Subtract 1. Negative 1 comes out. Subtract 1. You're done. All right? So if you did the quotient rule, I probably gave you credit so long as you did it correctly, but then the problem was after that, people would try and simplify it and they would just mess the algebra up in that. So 
All right. Otherwise, the only other like red flags I saw were on like number two, where it said use the definition of the derivative. <clears throat> that means use the limit definition. Where's yours? Alberto? Yeah. Okay. And James, there you go. Okay. Uh, by the way, your score is on the bottom of the second page. Should be on the bottom right hand corner of the second page. When you said use the definition of the derivative, you said use the limit? That means you have to use the limit as h goes to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h, or the other definition, f of uh, limit um, x approaches a. One of the two. And that was the only problem on the test where you had to do that. I did see some students try and use the limit definitions later in the test, which would have made it really hard to take some derivatives. So, But <clears throat> overall, very, very pleased with the results. Um, and we move on. <laughs> All right. Um, you probably had a good spring break. I hope you did and you've forgotten a lot of what we were doing. Okay, so just a quick reminder, <clears throat> what we had talked about was implicit differentiation. Oh, I can't spell. Differentiation, all right. Who cares? Implicit differentiation. So I'm going to do one problem real quick just to make sure we all kind of remember what we were doing. All right? So let's say we have x squared y squared plus x minus 3y equals 1. So you start out with an equation. And let's say we're going to do a couple of part problems here. Part A, I ask you to find dy dx. This means we are going to differentiate this with respect to what variable? X. x. That comes from this right here. That means anytime we take the derivative of x with respect to x, it's a 1, right? But if we take the derivative of y with respect to x, it's dy dx. It doesn't turn into a 1. So we go about this by taking the derivative with respect to x on both sides of the equation. So we write dy, d, uh, sorry, d dx of the left side. And then equals, we do d dx of the right side. So we're taking the derivative with respect to x of this equals derivative with respect to x of, of uh, 1. So let's do the right side first. What's the right side? Derivative of 1. Zero, okay, derivative of any constant is always zero. Now, when I do the derivative here, how am I gonna handle this piece right here? Product rule, right? We have a product between these two. So we have to apply the product rule when we take the derivative. So let's try this. If I take the derivative of x squared, right, so we go product rule is derivative of this times this plus the derivative of this times this, right? That's what I'm about to do. So what is the derivative of x squared with respect to x? Just 2x, right? OK, so that's 2x. And then times y squared. That's the first part of the product rule. And then plus now the derivative of, of y squared. So this is the part that you have to be careful with. When we're taking the derivative of y squared with respect to x, the 2 is going to come out, right? 2y. I got it. I got it. 2y, and then, yeah, I'll fit. 2y, come, uh, the 2 comes out, so you go 2y to the first power, right? That's not a derivative. And then times the derivative of what's here. And what's the derivative of y with respect to x? dy, dy, dy dx, OK? All right, so when I do this derivative of y squared here, I get 2y dy dx, and then what? Don't forget to finish the product rule off. Plus x squared. Times, times x squared. Okay, so again, derivative of the first one times the second one plus the derivative of the second one 
times the first one. There's your product rule. Now I can continue on. I'm gonna run out of room, so let me move this equal zero over. <clears throat> now I move on plus, what is the derivative of x with respect to x? One. And then minus three is a constant attached, right? So it's just gonna come for the ride. And then what is the derivative of y? dy dx. And then what you would do is you would, I'm gonna stop here, but you would get all your dy dx terms on one side, everything else to the other side, factor it out, divide through. Okay, that, that look familiar now? Okay, let me, let me do part B. Part B, find dx dy. So now I'm differentiating with respect to y instead of x, right? So let's see how that changes things. This, I'm gonna just kinda cheat here and just reuse what I already have here. I take the derivative with respect to y on both sides. <clears throat> I still have a product rule here, right? But things are gonna be a little different. When I take the derivative of x squared with respect to y, the two comes out, x to the first power, but now what? Yes. Times dx dy, because that's no longer one, right? When you, when you cover that two up after you bring the two out, the derivative of x is no longer one, because we're differentiating with respect to y. Okay, so we're gonna have that in the front, two x uh, dx dy, what next? Times y. times y squared, so that's your product rule, derivative of this times that plus, now derivative of y squared. This is just 2y now, because if we do this with respect to y, right, the 2 comes out, 2y. Now chain rule says now cover up the 2, take derivative of what's here, what's the derivative of y with respect to y? 1, right? So that's, there's, no, there's nothing out here. Make sense? Okay. So we have 2y, and then we have times x squared, because that's finishing the product rule, and then plus, what's the derivative of x with respect to y? dx dy again, and then minus three, and then what's the derivative of y with respect to y? Just one, so that's just gonna be minus three, and then equals this side, zero, okay? So then you would get your dx, dy terms on one side, everything else on the other, factor out, divide through. Yes? One more. Find dx, dt. So we're differentiating with respect to what variable? t, right? And t does not appear t does not appear in our equation, which means that we will never get a one. You know how we got like dy dy and we had one or we had dx dx, we had one, here we will never get a one ever because we're differentiating with respect to a variable that doesn't appear here. So when I do this, differentiate with respect to t of this side and then differentiate with respect to t on this side. Well, the right side's zero. That's never gonna change. And <clears throat> over here, we still have product rule. So what is the derivative of x squared with respect to t? 2x dx dt times y squared. So that's derivative of x squared is 2x dx dt. Everyone understand that part? Any questions? Now's the time. Times y squared plus what? 2y dy dt. For the same reason, you're not going to get a 1. So you're going to have dy dt here. And then times x squared. I'm still going to run out of room. So plus, what's the derivative of x with respect to t? So dx dt 
Okay, that's this. And then minus 3 comes for the ride. What's the derivative of y with respect to t? dy dt. And what are we trying to solve for here? dx dt. dx dt is here, and it's in this term, right? Those two terms have the dx dt in it. So what you would do on the next step is you would get these two on one side, take the others to the other side, factor out a dx dt, and then divide through. What I want, what I want to make clear, though, on this problem is that if you're, if you're looking at this, right, if you're asked for this, what we're really saying is this. Um, how fast is x changing if uh, we change t just slightly? That's bad English, but I don't care. Not an English major. All right. So if I change t just a little bit, how much does x change? Right? That's what this is saying. That's what I want to know. And if you look at the answer, we want to know what that is. Right? Right there. In order to ever solve for what's in red, what do you have to know? Well, you have to know what x is, don't you? You have to know what y is, right? You have to know what y is in x. You'd have to know what x and y are, but you'd also have to know what? You'd also have to know this, which is how fast y is changing if t changes a little bit. So would we solve for dy dt eventually? This would be given to us in the problem. Okay, okay this is very important because of what we're about to do today. If I want to know dx dt, I have to know a lot of other information. I need to know x, y, and I need to know the rate at which y is changing with respect to t. If I know all of that, then I can find dx dt. But if I don't know how fast y is changing with respect to t, I can't answer the, I can never solve for this. Do you all see that? So it's kind of like we have one, two, three, like four unknowns. Yeah, sorry, dy dt is down here also. It's like I have four unknowns, right? dx dt, dy dt, x and y. If I ever want to solve for one of those, I have to have the other three, all right? If you look back on the previous problems that we just did, part A and B, if you solve for dy d, dx or dx dy, if you go back and look at those answers, you only have three things you don't know. You don't know this, and then you don't know x and y. And in this one, you don't know this, and you don't know x and y. This is, the, this is the only example that I've shown you where you actually have three things you don't know out of the four things that are there. I hope that makes sense. I think it'll come together a little bit more as we start to do these word problems. <clears throat> All right, here we go. So we are going to do the last section in the chapter two. I started talking about this at the very end, but it was right before a test and it's spring break and so I don't expect that you remember much of this. Basically all this says is you're about to do word problems and it's going to suck, okay? That's what this is saying. And that, you know, historically this is, this is one of the two hardest sections in the class. And it's because they're word problems. All right, now with this related rates, that's what this section is called. Think about what the title of the section is. Related rates. It's saying how, what is the relationship between the rates of change of, of things. Like if, if you have some physical quantity and one, one thing is changing a little bit here, how does that affect the change in something else? Um, we'll, we're going to start with geometric pictures to kind of get an idea, but there's no, there's no like cookie cutter way of doing these. It's not like product rule, quotient rule, chain rule, where it's a very systematic. Like once you get the product rule, it's like, it's like kind of robotic, right? You just kind of do it. Um, but with related rate problems, there's just a strategy that we try and use. And here's the strategy. It's not going to make a whole lot of sense until we do a problem. But let's just go through the steps. We want to draw pictures, OK? And we want to draw a picture of the situation we're looking at 
And we're going to actually have two different pictures that we're going to draw. We're going to draw a picture of what, what we're going to call the exact moment in question, and then a general picture. So the best way I can explain this is this. Let's say that I'm like running, right? Okay, so I'm in motion, right? So as I'm moving, at any point in time, at any point in time, you could have told me to freeze. And then I would be like stuck. This is, this is an exact moment in time. But in general, I'm moving, right? Like if you just saw me like this, you would say I'm not moving. But that's only because I paused the video, so to speak, right? In, in reality, I'm moving the whole time. So our two pictures are going to look at those two scenarios. The exact moment is the snapshot, the still, the pause, right? And then this is going to be the general, the general picture, like th that motion is occurring, if that makes sense. Again, when we do an example, I think it'll be um, a little easier for you to see how this all come together. We're going to have to assign variables whenever, you know, if there's something that's changing, we have to assign a variable to it. Um, anything that's a constant, we're going to label the constants. And after we've done all the assignments of variables, we're going to <coughs> write down what's given to us in the word problem, what information is given, and what it is that we want to find. So what is the question telling us to go look for? Okay, so we have four things so far. We have picture, like a general picture, an exact moment picture. We assign all the variables. We write down what we're given and what we want. All right, that's kind of, and you'll see when I do a problem, I'm going to kind of break it up like that. And then the big thing is step four, which is once you know what you want, and once you know what you're given, you have to find an equation that somehow connects what you want to what you're given. And that equation can come from any sort of math in your background, geometry, just basic knowledge of triangles, it just, it can come from anywhere, all right? Areas of circles, uh, surface areas of spheres, things that are on your formula sheets. But there's no limit to where these equations can come from. Law of cosines from pre-cal, anywhere, all right? Once we have that equation, we are going to use implicit differentiation and we will differentiate the equation that we found in number four. And we'll do it implicitly and most of the time, we're going to be um, doing it with respect to t, or time. All right? And then after we do that, we plug in our constants and we'll be able to solve the problem. So that's our general strategy. I know it looks weird. Let's, let's start to get to a problem. Now, this right here is not a problem yet, OK? So we have not started this. This is just to get us thinking. All right, so some preliminary things. Could we answer these? If I tell you the radius of a circle is three feet, then can you tell me the area? Yes? What's the, what's the formula for the area of a circle? Area is pi r squared, right? So if I tell you that the radius is three feet, you just plug three in here, right? Three is nine, nine pi. Nine pi is the area, right? So we can do that, all right? What if I tell you the diameter of a circle is 2.5? Can you tell me the area? Okay, how? Well, the area, is, the area is pi r squared, right? But what is r? In, in, they're giving us the diameter, right? This is half the diameter. So this formula is the same as pi times the diameter, I'll use capital D, over 2 squared, isn't it? So I could just use the relationship that your diameter is, it, sorry, your radius is half your diameter. So just replace r with d, and then you have a new formula in here, don't you? Yes, so you just plug in diameter right here, divide by 2, square it, pi, you get the answer. Got it? OK, so nothing crazy yet. All right, what if I tell you the diameter of a circle is 1 foot? Can you tell me the circumference? OK, so what would you need to know in order to do that? You need to know that the circumference of a circle is 2 pi r. And we just said what r is, right? Because they gave us diameter. So we could rewrite this formula as 2 times pi times d over 2. And these two cancel. You actually just get the diameter times pi is the circumference. 
So you could do that now, right, if, if you were asked to. Um, what about number four? What if I tell you the circumference of a circle is 100 inches? Can you find the area? Ooh. Okay, this one's a little more involved. If I tell you that the circumference of a circle is 100 inches, can you find its area? Well, let's write down our formulas. We know circumference, we just said, is 2 pi r, didn't we? And what is the area of a circle? Pi r squared, right? So if I tell you the circumference of a circle is 100, you could just come over here and say 100 is 2 pi r, right? And then you can solve that for r. Divide both sides by, by 2 pi, and what would you get? So divide by 2 first, you get 50. Divide by pi, you get 50 over pi. That's what your radius is. And then you take that radius and come back over here, and you could plug it in and get your area. Does that make sense? So now your area would be pi times your radius, which is that, 50 over pi squared. And then you could just calculate that. Yes? No questions yet. Uh, can we just turn on the light? Let's yeah, you want the light? Yeah. yeah? I tried opening that. It was a little brighter here a little while ago. There we go. OK, so is number four OK? You understand how we could do that? We have to use two formulas and kind of like make them somehow go from one to the other. All right, let's look at number five. If the area of a circle, I didn't put that here, did I? Sorry. I should have put that. If the area of a circle is 24 pi, what is its circumference? So let me write down the two formulas here. Area is pi r squared. And circumference was what? 2 pi r. I know the area is 24 pi. That's, that's this, right? That has to be that. And cancel the pi's, and you get 24 is r squared. So what's r? r is square root of 24. And I don't have to do plus or minus because the radius has to be positive, right? And then now I just take that and plug that in here. So the circumference would be 2 pi times root 24, whatever that number is. OK? So every single problem that we've done, this is what it says right here, every single problem that I've done up to this point, the circles that I'm talking about are in what I refer to as a static state. They are, they are frozen, right? They are not moving. They're just circles. It's a fixed radius or a fixed circumference. That's not what we're interested in. But in order to do what we need to do, we, have to, we first have to be able to deal with them if they're not moving. OK, so in all the problems, our circle static state, fixed circle, uh, blah, blah, blah. OK. So what we are looking for, what, instead, what we're looking for is we're asking ourselves about the instantaneous rate of change, more specifically, the way that the rate of change in one variable affects the rate of change of another. So I have this animation here. And I, I did this in class just very quickly last time. Do I want to play this? I don't want to play it. Hmm. Yeah, let me play it first. So what I have here is a circle that's growing. And <clears throat> what's happening here is that the radius, the radius is growing at a constant rate. I, remember me doing this? I said, if you just watch the radius number, it's counting like at a regular pace. Let me, let me speed it up a little bit. So three, four, five, six, one, two, right? Three. So I'm not speeding that up. So that radius is growing at a constant rate. But look at the area. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. See how fast it starts going? 30, 40, I mean now 50, 60. So this area is not growing at a constant rate. The radius is, but the area is not. Do you all see that? 
Is it obvious enough to you? Okay, so what we're interested in knowing is, let's say we have this circle that's growing at a certain rate, right? This is, I give you some certain rate that this radius is, is growing at. Let's say that you look at it, maybe that's traveling, I don't know, one inch every second. Then how fast is the area changing at a specific moment in time? So like if I, if I say right there, right at that instant, if we froze it at that moment in time, let me freeze it. Right there, if I freeze it right there, that little change in radius, how does that affect the change in area? And if I move out here and I froze it here, then a little change here is going to have a bigger impact on the area. Right? So there's going to be different, you're going to have a different rate of change depending on where your circle is. Now I try and break this down, I think, eh, maybe I don't. Okay, let's just do this problem. This is our first one. All right. If the radius of a circle is increasing at a constant rate of 0.5 feet every second, so it's like I'm drawing that circle, the radius is growing at a constant rate, then how fast is its area increasing when the radius is 4 feet? All right, so let's just take that all in first. We have a growing circle. So I'm going to start with two pictures. I'm going to have my general picture. And then I'm going to have my moment picture. Or if you like, I might refer to it as my instant, my instant in time. This is where we hit the pause button, right? So which one do you want to start with? Maybe, maybe the one, let's do the one that's the instant in time, because I'm thinking you might be able to see it clear. I don't know. Tell me about the circle when I freeze it. Tell me about it. Is there anything you know about it when I freeze it? Its radius is 4. Okay? Look, if the radius of a circle is increasing at a constant rate then, uh, of 0.5 feet per second, then how fast is its area increasing when the radius is 4? So it's like it's growing, it's growing, it's growing, and then I, then I hit pause right when I'm at 4 feet. So in the instant in time, this is four feet, right? That, that's my picture of my circle at that instant in time. Now, in general, in general, I just have a circle. These don't necessarily have to be the same size. I have a circle that's growing, right? And so if I draw a circle that's growing and I label here to here, I cannot label it four because it's moving, right? It's a variable. So I'm going to call it r because, well, r is a variable. So far, are we okay? See the difference? One of them's changing, the other one's not. I also said you want to write down what you're given in the problem and then what you want. Now, when, you, when you're looking at your given, usually, this is going to be a rate of change of something. All right, so what are we given in terms of a rate of change? 0.5 feet per second. Do you see feet per second? Yes. That's like miles per hour. That is a rate, that is a speed, right? Speed is a derivative. So this is, this is the derivative of something. What is it the derivative of? Well, what is, what is growing at 0.5 feet per second? The what? The radius. the radius is. The radius, right, is increasing at a rate. Those are the key words. Those right there. The radius is increasing at a rate derivative of 0.5 feet per second. Then what that's telling you is that the rate at which r changes with respect to t, t being time, right? Radius. The radius would be measured in what units? What units are the radius measured in this problem? Feet. Time here is measured in what? Seconds. seconds. Feet over seconds. Feet over seconds. R over T. Do you all see that? Ra uh, radius over time. So this is equal to uh, 0 0.5 feet per second. 
That's given to us. The rate at which the radius changes with respect to time. What is it that we want? How fast is the area increasing, right? I'm interested in, right, this is, this is the question of what we want. This right here, this, this is the part that we're interested in. How fast is the area increasing? How fast means the derivative, right? So dA over dt. Here, A is going to stand for area, right? I want to know how fast the area is changing with respect to time. This is what I want to know. But I don't want to know it just arbitrarily. I want to know it at an instant in time. At what instant in time? So when, when what's four feet? When R is four feet. OK. That's the setup. From the word problem, general picture that's changing. Instant in time, what we're given as a derivative, what we want as a derivative, and at exactly the moment that we are to, uh, talking about here, right? We want to know how fast this is changing at exactly the moment that the radius is four feet. All right? The next step is to find an equation that somehow relates what we're given to what we want. Any equation you can think of that somehow relates the radius of a circle to the area of a circle. Area is pi r squared, right? So the equation that I'm going to use for this problem is area equals pi r squared. Now think about this. Think about this. We started the class, and I gave you an example. We did dy dx, dx dy, and then I did dx dt, right? Look at this right here. If I have a and r in here, these are the only variables in here. If I differentiate this with respect to time, what's, gonna, what's going to appear? I have an A here, so when I differentiate that with respect to time, what's going to appear? A DA DT is going to appear, isn't it? And that's what I want. And when I differentiate R, at some point in the differentiation of R, I'm going to get a DR DT, aren't I? And I'm given that. Did you all see that? We, we find this equation because we, when we differentiate it with respect to time, the things we are given in what we want are going to appear in here. And then we have a way of solving for it. All right? Let's do it. We have the equation. Now it's time to differentiate. So differentiate with respect to t. So now differentiate with respect to t. I'm abbreviating with respect to that. Uh, math people, we do this a lot. I'm not, just, I'm not that lazy. In math, you see that a lot. With respect to t. All right, let's do it. <clears throat> Take derivative with respect to t on the left side equals the derivative with respect to t of the right side. All right, what is, see, I have sticks, I have sticks, I have sticks. Here we go. Derek, where's Derek? All right, Derek. What is this, Derek? DADT, that's all it is. And Derek, are you happy to see that? Yeah. Because that's what we want, right? So it better appear somewhere, or else we're never going to be able to solve for it, right? OK, equals. All right, now on this side, Emily. Hi, Emily. You seem excited. I, you haven't heard my question yet, though. What is, what is pi in this? Is it a variable or a constant? Is, is, this, is this, pi is just a number? Yeah. 
right? So what's going to happen when I differentiate pi when it's attached to this? It'll, it'll just come down with me, right? So when I differentiate this, pi is going to be here. Now, Emily, let's keep going. What's the derivative of r squared with respect to time? Let's go for it. 2r. Okay, so you've brought the 2 out. You've taken care of the 2. Don't worry about the pi. Now you need to differentiate this. There you go, dr dt. Does everyone see that? <coughs> Are we done with the differentiation? Brian, you have a question? No, I'm saying Yeah, because this was a constant, right? So it came down, and then all we were differentiating was r squared. So there's no product rule here because this is a constant, so it comes down. Had this been another letter, then we would have done product rule. Yes? Uh -huh. I think the derivative was constant. If it's by itself. Okay. okay, so think about this. Back when we were first doing derivatives, if we took the derivative of 4x squared, you would have said the derivative is 8x. So the 2 came out, but the 4 just came with us, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you do 4 by itself, the derivative of 4 by itself is 0. But because it's attached to a variable, it just comes for the ride. Okay? All right. We are done with the differentiation. Yes? So pi is a constant, right? Pi is a constant. So 2 times pi? 2 pi, yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah. I mean, if you don't like the way that looks, you could put 2 in front of pi. All right. We have differentiated, right? Oops. Forgot to silence my phone. So what now? Now it's plug and chug, OK? This is the part that's the, the, the I guess, easiest part of the problem, if you want to say. You just take a look at what you have. DA, DT, we said we were happy to see that, right? Because that's what we're solving for. We don't care about pi because pi is pi. Now, what about r? Do we know what r is? R is 4 at the moment in time that we're talking about. And dr dt, do we know that? It's 0.5, right? So here's what I can put. dA dt equals pi times 2 times 4 times uh, 0.5. I'm going to put half, OK? Pi 2 r 0.5. And now just multiply that all together, and what do you get? Is it 4 pi? OK, so you get 4 pi. Right, 4 pi. Now, th the final thing is for us, we must determine what this is. This is a rate of change, isn't it? This is dA dt, dA dt. So, How would we measure area if, if the unit of a, if, if this circle that we had here was four feet, right? Then when we talk about its area, what unit would we use for area? Square feet. Square feet, right? Feet squared. So this should be feet squared per, and then down here is time. Time is measured in seconds in this problem. So per second. So at the very end, when you get your numerical answer, you have to put your unit here. And to do your unit, you just look at these two things and ask yourselves, how do we measure them? How do you measure area? Squared units. Right? If this was volume, like a volume of a box, we'd use cubed units. If this was a length of something, then we would just use feet. Right? And then t is dictated by the problem. Here it was in seconds, so it's per second. All right. What do you think? One very, key, one very key part of this problem is that when you get to the equation, at this point right here, do not plug in 4. Why? If you plug 4 in, you're basically, what you're doing is this. <clears throat> okay. 
If I'm running, right, and I plug in four, that's, that's you stopping it, right? You're stopping me running, and then you're asking how fast are you going? But I'm not moving. See, when you plug, if you plug four in right here, you've frozen your circle, and then you're asking how fast is it changing? It's not, you froze it, right? But if I don't plug four in, that's like me running and then saying, right there. You see, I'm still moving. It's at that moment, but I'm not freezing it. I'm, I'm, does that make sense? You can't freeze the variable and then ask how much it's changing by. You have to let it still be a variable, then differentiate, and then after the differentiation, you freeze it. Okay. Hope that makes sense. Different problem. Take a moment to read the problem. <clears throat> uh, I, I said read it and then I took it away, sorry. Hold on, I want to show you something here. Okay, check, take a look at this circle. Hurry up before it goes too big. Look at, the, look at the area right now. The area is counting. Right? It's, the area is changing by a constant rate this time. And the radius is no longer constant. So let me, let me back it up so you can see this. Keep an eye on the, keep an eye on the radius. Okay? Watch what happens. Look at the radius. Look at how fast the radius is coming up. One. And then, you just have to trust me, this is counting the same. Look at the radius. Then, two. Okay, so let's see how long it takes to get to three. Can you tell it's slowing down? Okay, now it's at three, so let's see. That, that took a little while, didn't it? Yeah. Let's see how long it takes to, to get to four. <laughs> the area is growing at a constant rate, but the radius isn't anymore, still not there. Okay, now let's see how long it takes to get to five. So think about this. If you are if if you're adding area to this, imagine you're you're pouring paint, okay? It's like a, a puddle. You say you start pouring something and the puddle starts expanding, right? In the beginning it's very fast, but as you, you continue pouring at the same rate, the puddle grows and grows, but it gets slower and slower. Yes. I have a potential easier analogy for you. So we'll first talk about the one you talked about last time, or compare them rather. Think about it as a We just got to five. <laughs> the last problem, your radius expanded quite drastically as your, uh, or rather your, your area expanded drastically as your radius increased. Exactly. So you think of it as like you have, that's a quarry, if you will, and you're digging a hole. But you okay. have a ton of workers, so your hole expands significantly faster because you have a lot of workers who are shoveling out, or shoveling more, rather. In this case, you are still having to create the same. You're shoveling the same amount out. But you're only using one worker this time. So it takes significantly longer because you have one worker that has to basically. I, I kind of like that idea. I mean, I see this is one of those times where I actually do see where you're coming from. <laughs> okay. So like, yeah, if you're, if you're going around the edge and you're a guy digging up, digging around, right? And you can only dig at a certain rate then as you go out, it's gonna take you longer and longer to go out, because you gotta go around further and further. further yeah, I, I think that makes sense. Makes sense to me. I probably you my explanation. No, I think you did okay, I, I got that, I got that. Okay, so yes, this is a different problem. 
If the area of a circle is increasing at a constant rate of one-fifth square feet per second, then how fast is the radius increasing when the area is five square feet? You know what? Let's, before we do this, I think it might be worthwhile to sit here and talk about why in the world you would ever want to do any of this, like in the real world, okay? Let me just, just real quick example. Um, I'm assuming you might know how a piston engine works. You basically, for an engine in a car, you have a piston that's um, attached to a shaft that goes down to um, a crankshaft that turns. This is a really bad picture. And then you have, you have the cylinder that the piston is gonna move. You know, you get gas in here, explosion, pushes the piston down, piston pushes this, this goes around a circle and you basically get your turning motion. Okay, so you're turning up and down motion into circular motion, all right? If this, if this piston is coming down at a certain speed, let's say that, this, that you get the explosion in here and this piston comes down at a certain speed, then the question would be how fast is that point turning? Does that make sense? So a change, a little change here has what impact on right here? And as this piston comes down, it may slow down a little bit or speed up, depends. In the beginning, it's gonna move real fast. So the rate at which this changes somehow has a relationship with the rate that this changes. So does it seem that you might be interested as an engineer to know how these uh, rates are related to one another, right? If you're designing something? Because the speed of this point around here is gonna also have something to do with torque and you've got to make sure you manufacture this so that it can handle the speed that this is going to be spinning at, right? So, I mean, there's just a lot of things where things are in motion, right? And physics is, physics is relatively simple when things aren't moving. But when things move, things become complicated. And this calculus, what we're doing is we're finding a way to deal with things when they're in motion, as opposed to just static. All right, here we go. Picture time. You can tell your, your friends that you're, you're in uh, calculus and we just drew pictures all day. Okay. Instant given what we want in the equation. All right. Okay, anyone want to go out on a limb for me and tell me what my general picture should look like? A circle? Okay, you're on a roll. How about the instant? A circle again. Okay, what's the difference between these? How about on the instant? There's something else I should talk about at the instant. The what? What can I say about the, the moment in time we're talking about? Can I label this or do anything about this? Is there anything about the instant in time that I know? Mm. So when we take the snapshot, right? When we take the snapshot, at that instant we take the snapshot, we want to know how fast its radius is increasing, right? At the moment, what, that what? When the area is five square feet, right? That's the snapshot. So in this picture, when I'm, when I'm freezing it, what I can tell you is that the area of this is five square feet. At this instant, the area is five square feet. Back over there in that picture, the general picture, it's, it's moving, right? Everything's changing, so I can't fix it. So the area over here is what? Just area, right? It's not a variable, it's just area. Now look, when you do this whole thing that I'm doing right here, there's no particular order you have to go in. You could put down what you're given first or what you want first, draw your pictures later. There's, remember, it's, it's a it's a procedure, not, not a procedure, it's kind of a strategy, but it's not cookie cutter, step one, two, three, four. It's just get all the information up here however, however you can. So 
Anyone want to tell me what else I can put up here? Given speed of what? What is this? It's, the, it's a rate of change, isn't it? It's a speed. It's a derivative. It's a derivative of what? It's the derivative of the area. How do you know that? Because it says it. If the area of a circle is increasing at a rate, right? Not only can you tell from that, square feet over seconds is area over seconds, isn't it? Area over time. So they're giving us that dA dt, the change in area with respect to time, is one-fifth square feet per second. What else? We want what? dr dt. We want how fast is the radius changing, right? We want dr dt. When do we want that? When the area is 5 square feet. Does that all make sense? Sure? OK. Equation? You've got to relate two things together here. You've got to try and relate area and r. Any, any equation you come up with that has area and r in it in reference to a circle. We just used it, right? Same one. Good old uh, area is pi r squared. We know that when we differentiate this, we're going to get a dA dt, and we're going to get a dr dt. And both of those appear here. So let's go ahead and differentiate. When you're doing your homework, you might see me do this. When you do the homework, I, I usually use a squiggly line to let everyone know that I'm about to differentiate with respect to time. I don't, I don't write like ddt anymore. You know how like I'd write ddt here, ddt here? I just take the derivative, but I do that to let you know I'm about to do it, All right? Just so you know. So what is the derivative of this with respect to time? Well, we just did that, didn't we? It's the same exact equation. So the left side's that. The right side is two, uh, pi times 2r times d, 2r. Ah. The right side is pi times 2r times dr dt. And now we just check. Da dt, we have one fifth, right? R, do we know R? Hmm, we actually don't. I'm going to do a little check marks here. I'm happy to see this because I know what it is. Dr dt, I'm happy to see because that's what I'm trying to find. But R, I don't know. I don't know. But now I'm allowed to freeze everything in time. Now I can because I've differentiated. At this point, I can freeze. I mean, yeah, I can freeze it. Now, when I freeze it, I know that my area is 5, right? If my area is 5, can you tell me what r is? Yes. So now what I'm going to do is just kind of on the side here, I'm going to say this right here tells me if area is 5, that means 5 is pi r squared, right? And I can solve this for r. Divide both sides by pi. and then take the square root. So when the area of a circle is 5 square feet, the radius is the square root of 5 over pi. And now I can bring that back in here and stick it right in here for r. With me? So let's see what happens here. This becomes pi times 2 times root 5 over root pi times, what's dr dt? I don't know what, oh wait, this side, sorry, I forgot to write what over here? Uh, one fifth. One fifth. One fifth is equal to pi 2. Now r, I, re, I wrote it, I split it up into a fraction like this, okay? You'll see why in a second. And then dr dt is what I want to know, so I'm going to leave it dr dt. So I split this pi up because this pi and this pi don't cancel, but